Um, welcome everybody um, to this uh, latest uh, street side sessions. Um, today we'll focus on OXT's latest update um, called you know, fingerprint mode. Um, this update uh, has been something that we've been working on for a little while. Uh, we released a few weeks ago and um, you know, it'd be good for uh, uh, you know, some people to see a little bit of a walkthrough and just know kind of where we're coming from and, and why we, um, you know, why we put this out there. Um, so, you know, why do we do this? Um, number one is uh, a better UX for us as, as analysts. Um, if you remember back to, I guess, maybe one or two street side sessions ago, I did a ransomware tracking, um, you know, live stream of OXT. And I was having to jump in and out of the transaction graph to uh, keep an eye on the fingerprint of the wallet that we were tracking. Um, and that's a bit of a pain to do. Um, it'd be easier to just display this on the graph, which is what we've decided to do, right? And if we can display this directly on the graph, uh, we'll be better um, at tracking, we'll have better accuracy, we'll be less likely to miss um, uh, a new wallet fingerprint, new software uh, uh, fingerprint, which can you know, be a sign of, of coins either changing hands potentially, or at the very least, you know, a new software being used to spend coins. Um, and we've used fingerprinting um, quite a bit. Uh, it's becoming more common, I think. Um, one of the biggest ones was, uh, was identifying um, the custodial tumbler blender uh, as it piggybacked off of Wasabi's coin joins. Um, we picked up that, that uh, very distinct fingerprint. Um, and so, you know, not only do we get better UX, we get better accuracy. Um, if, if you guys are auditing your transactions, um, like we hope you do with OXT, uh, you can get a better sense for just how bad things really are. You know, what is the state of, of you know, Bitcoin's default privacy? Uh, and maybe you don't need to understand everything that we're going to talk about in detail, but uh, if we can just present this visually, um, even without totally understanding, you may be able to, uh, um, you know, uh, understand just how bad things can kind of be. Um, and the, the, the last thing that was sort of a motivating factor is, is kind of the, the research that we've been seeing coming from, you know, uh, academics um, funded by the likes of chain analysis and, and others. Um, and so, you know, what we'll do first is we'll just review kind of what a typical transaction structure looks like. You know, if you've never seen a Bitcoin transaction before, uh, this is uh, what we call um, a simple spend. It's got one input and two outputs. Um, one of these two outputs is very likely to be a uh, change output that returns you know, the surplus from this payment back to the user's original wallet. And if we can track these change outputs, we can track a user over multiple transactions. And so one of the um, uh, biggest ways that changes is, is, is tracked uh, is with a handful of heuristics. Um, this heuristic is an example um, of the you know uh, different script type heuristic, where we have an input uh, with a, a P2SH from a P2SH address starts with a three, uh, and we've got two outputs, um, one with a P2SH at, you know output, and another with a pay to public key hash output. Um, because we've got you know a, a different script on the the output side, we can you know deduce that that first output that starts with a one is a likely payment. And the second output is a likely change back to the user. Uh, another change detection uh, heuristic that's used is the round payment amount heuristic. So if you look at the outputs of this transaction, um, you can sort of ask yourself, which of these amounts did the user likely type in input? Which of these was the likely intended spend? Um, in this case, it would be the 0 0.17 BTC coin, which makes the other 6.5 um, and change uh, output the change. And you can even see that OXT will uh, apply the round payment amount heuristic to this transaction and tell us which output is change. And um, another one of the uh, pretty powerful heuristics is the uh, unnecessary input heuristic. So this is uh, a spend with two inputs. Um, and in this case, uh, both of the inputs needed to be uh, co-spent together by the same wallet in order to make this 9.2 uh, BTC output payment, right? So alone, the 
0.6 Bitcoin input and the 5.6 roughly Bitcoin input were not enough to make that 9.2 BTC spend, right? Which makes, um, which means we can deduce that the, you know, 9, uh, 9.2 BTC output uh, is the likely payment and the remaining output is the likely change. Um, and this heuristic is also pretty powerful. And um, it's what we're seeing. Um, th that's just a handful of heuristics that are being used um, and leveraged uh, to, you know, fingerprint users and, and track them. So, um, you know, here's um, a handful of things that uh, uh, can be used to deduce, you know, wallet fingerprint, right? Which, uh, does it have a preferred script type for spending? Does it have a preferred TXO change position, lock time, version number, replaced by fee, et cetera? All of these can be used to fingerprint a wallet. And so to get into kind of some of the research that's coming down the line, um, here's one paper um, from the Financial Cryptography uh, uh, Symposium where uh, two researchers from Princeton University have applied a machine learning algorithm to the Bitcoin blockchain data set uh, in an attempt to um, what they call resurrect address clustering in Bitcoin. But what this really means is um, uh, track a user over multiple transactions automatically. Um, can, we, can we detect change uh, realistically, accurately enough on our own uh, to, automated, uh, to do an automated tracking? Um, and a similar paper, well, actually this one, uh, this is a slide from that same paper that talks about um, how wallet fingerprinting and their, their heuristics have improved with time. So um, if we remember back to before SegWit was activated, there was really only, you know, one or two script types, um, pay to public key hash, and I think just pay to public key. Um, when SegWit was introduced, we got uh, a new script type, which this graph, you know, sort of implies um, has basically increased the, um, the accuracy of their, their, uh, their heuristics. Um, and one last paper to just sort of talk about here. Um, this is the same as the same type of graph, same type of process as that uh, two slides ago, um, where, you know, they're again, applying a, a machine learn learning algorithm to the Bitcoin blockchain in an attempt to automatically uh, track and cluster users or multiple transactions. Um, you know, these area under the curve numbers are relatively high. Um, I guess maybe mathematicians will have to debate if that's high enough, but um, it implies that, you know, some of these uh, machine learning algorithms have gotten, you know, really quite accurate. Um, an area under the curve of one would be perfect. This one's 0 0.923. Um, and so, you know, what does this, you know, mean for Bitcoin users? You know, without sort of same defaults that are applied at the wallet level, um, automated tracking uh, may be uh, coming down the pipeline. Um, this goes beyond just, um, clustering by the common input ownership heuristic, um, chain analysis firms may be planning to uh, experiment with implementing some of these, you know, machine learning algorithm results um, into their automated tracking. Um, the second paper that I presented above uh, actually discusses some of the fixes that wallets can implement, you know, randomize the output positioning, um, like type scripts, um, and a few other things that can uh, make these uh, machine learning algorithms uh, a little less accurate, right? And so now what we'll do is uh, we'll transition to um, uh, a walkthrough example uh, on OXT to show you kind of um, how this looks visually on the graph. Ergo, do you want to share uh, a OXT link, a bookmark link or something for anyone who wants to follow along on their own computer? Uh, yeah, I can, I'll put one in after. Um, sure. I don't think you'll be able to follow along in real time, but, um, and I'll, you know, basically drop, um, maybe I can just do it right now. Um, drop some of these links that I just referenced into the chat. What I'll do too, is I'll drop the transaction ID that we're going to start with and, um, people Great. can follow Thank along you. that way. OK. 
Okay. Okay, um, so now we'll transition to uh, looking at these transactions on the OXT, you know, Explorer. Um, one of the big questions that a lot of people one have trouble with go. is, oh. I can't see your screen. I'm not sure if anyone else can. No screen? Okay, I just switched, let me see. There we go. How about now? Good? Yep, you're good. Okay. Okay, great. Um, close this. Here we go. So one of the things that um, a lot of people will have trouble with when they come to OXT, they're looking to access the transaction graph. Um, a lot of people are used to uh, plopping in a an address as their starting point um, in their block explorers. Uh, in order to access the transaction graph from the address page, if you do it that way, um, you have to be signed into OXT. Um, so one of the ways that I usually just start is by just um, inputting a transaction ID just to get going. And so this is uh, a transaction from a relatively new Russian darknet market called Nova that I think is likely being used to pay out to a vendor. Um, you can pull up OXT if you're signed in. Um, you can search through some of the public directory um, uh, entities that we have, uh, which I guess I probably should just show. And you can see we've got a list of some of the dark net markets here. Um, you know, so in this case, I had gone to Nova and I had basically picked um, a random transaction ID um, and then began exploring um, the graph from here. And so what you can see is on the left side of this screen from the transaction page, there's a display the transaction graph visualizer, uh, which just opened up um, the, uh, the visualizer here. And when I get started with an analysis, you know, usually one of the first things that I do is display the um, transaction uh, details um, in this little pane. Uh, this shows the amounts um, involved. And now with OXT's new new uh, fingerprint mode, um, I also usually turn on um, the uh, uh, transaction fingerprints. And so we'll fully expand this transaction by double clicking. And what we can see is, you know, a visual representation of these um, four inputs and one output. And with OXT's new fingerprint mode, um, we can see a, a few different uh, attributes here. Um, the first is uh, these uh, native SegWit inputs are this light blue color. Um, the pay to public key hash output is a yellow color. And then each of the uh, spending um, transactions has a slightly different um, fingerprint. Um, different version number. So if we hover over this transaction, we see that the version number is two and the lock time is set to uh, basically the block height. Going to this uh, transaction, we've got version two and a lock time of zero. And going to uh, this other transaction, we've got version one and a lock time of zero. And so the version numbers, I believe, yes, the version numbers are represented by different shades of gray. Uh, version one is darker uh, than version two. And uh, the lock times are represented by different shapes for the transactions. So in this case, um, uh, lock times um, are squares uh, and lock times equal to zero are circles. And so I'm going to leave a comment here, potentially hide this, but this was our starting point.
and we'll hide that for now. And as we go, I'm going to highlight the outputs, uh, or we're calling these, sorry, mark the outputs uh, that I think are controlled by the same wallet. Um, I'm gonna hide them for now. Um, and what we'll do at the end is toggle that on and off um, to sort of help highlight a little bit better um, what it is that we've, or how we've sort of tracked the same, uh, you know, likely wallet over multiple transactions. So um, going forward, um, I'm gonna double click and expand this transaction. Um, we could also uh, selectively uh, expand inputs and outputs um, by hovering uh, just to the right of uh, um, the, uh, the TXOs and the transaction detail page. But I'm just gonna double click and we'll see how this starts to progress. Um, and so what we can see here uh, is we've got uh, another uh, transaction that creates uh, a, a, a multi-sig output, this dashed orange line, and uh, a, uh, another P2PKH output. Um, if we apply our uh, different script type heuristics, then this pay to public key hash output is the likely uh, change. And so we'll continue to follow this output and see if we can't notice a bit of a pattern. So again, another transaction that uh, creates uh, an, an, uh, an output for uh, a P2SH address. Uh, this light blue dashed line, and um, a, another P2PKH output in yellow. And so we'll follow again the P2PKH output by applying that uh, different script type heuristic. And so now we've got a handful of transactions, um, each with a lock time uh, equal to the block height in version number two. Um, each of these spending uh, a P2PKH, P2PKH output, right, which we can start to deduce is probably the, uh, the fingerprint of this uh, vendor's, potential vendor's wallet. And so we'll continue. And now we come to a transaction that has two inputs. We've already got one of those inputs expanded. Um, there's another um, input here. Um, and if we apply the unnecessary input heuristic to this transaction, um, what we'll see is that this 0 0.039 Bitcoin output is uh, likely the payment. Um, we can also apply the different script type heuristic here. Um, to help deduce that this is the likely payment um, because the 0 0.039 amount is more than both of these two inputs. So these two inputs had to be combined by this wallet in order to make that spend. And so now we have the choice of either um, following this change output forward or traversing back up the graph um, to, to follow the previous history of this this likely wallet. So what we'll do for now is we'll go forward. And in this case, we've got um, a transaction that uh, with two outputs that are still currently unspent. Um, both of them are P2PKH outputs. Um, both of them are for relatively similar amounts. Um, this transaction is relatively ambiguous. Um, if one of these outputs had been spent, we might be able to investigate that but for now, this is a bit of a dead end for us. Um, so what we'll do is we'll go back to traversing uh, back up the graph um, to continue to look at the, the history of this wallet. And what we see again is another uh, two input to output transaction, uh, similar to this previous one. Again, we could apply the unnecessary input heuristic here. Again, this 0 0.03, uh, roughly Bitcoin, uh, output is the likely payment, right? It's even to a different script type. And again, we have uh, two um, inputs that we can continue to traverse back and continue to search for uh, this wallet activity. Um, when we are traversing the graph 
for transactions with only one input, we really don't have a decision to make on which output. We don't have a decision to make on which input to follow since there's only one. Um, what we do need to just be careful of is, is a different fingerprint that might be sort of the end of this uh, transaction activity. So here we come to another transaction that's spending uh, two inputs uh, from the same address. Um, and this input is spent by a different uh, fingerprint here. So this is likely not the same user. And if we look in our transactions detail tab, uh, what we can see is that this is actually another uh, withdrawal from Nova, the, the Nova darknet market. So this is likely another uh, vendor payout here. And again, we can see that uh, different script types here um, and a similar sort of fingerprint to this original transaction that we started with. So we'll look at the other input to this transaction and we see a single UTXO spent. And this is likely some other service um, that was used to pay to this, this address. Um, this address may be, you know, uh, a, another darknet market, but because um, it's not included um, in this cluster and it's just a single output spent, we can't really, uh, you know, we can't really know. Um, but this is sort of the end of this, um, this part of the graph. Uh, we can't traverse back any further. Um, this other, you know, relatively large output is spent to, uh, buy a, a software with uh, a version two and lock time of zero. That's different from this version two and lock time of block height that we've been tracking. And so let's toggle now the highlighted addresses. And we can see where we started, went forward, forward again, and then back up to this point here. Um, and what we can you know, continue to do is applying these heuristics to this, you know, potential input as well. So again, another two input transaction, um, we could apply the unnecessary input heuristic here. And we also have the uh, different script type heuristics that can be applied. Um, and again, we've got now two inputs to um, follow back with. Again, all of these are still version two and lock time equal to the block height. So now we've got uh, a single transaction uh, or transaction with a single input, which makes things a bit easier for us. All of these are still pay to public key hash inputs. All of these are still lock time uh, equal to the block height in version two. And we get to another uh, reused address. This happens to be, um, this input happens to be a withdrawal from uh, another Russian darknet market, um, OMG market. Um, this cluster is relatively, you know, young. Um, there may be a secondary cluster with this uh, market that just, it just hasn't merged with yet. Um, but we'll just keep that in mind for now. So another withdrawal from a darknet market. And another single input spend. This time from Bitslotto, which is a sort of a, a, a an OTC peer-to-peer -peer marketplace um, popular in Ukraine and Russia. And so we've kind of come to the end of this, um, this line as well. I actually meant to add a note to this one. We'll add a comment. Need to highlight these outputs. And we're back to um, another single P2 uh, PKH input uh, in version uh, two and uh, 
block time, block height um, transaction to take, an, to take a look at. Talk this back off. Again, only a single input here. So no real decision to make. This transaction uh, is a spend to Binance. Um, so we're gonna mark this because uh, this is pretty bad. Um, and we'll go, we'll continue with this graph traversal first, but we'll revisit that Binance address in a bit. Okay. So now OXT has uh, expanded, um, automatically expanded the inputs to this transaction, which are linked, um, which sort of reorients the graph a little bit. So we'll have to get situated again. I'm gonna turn back on the comments for now, just so that we can see where we've been. Again, this was our start point. We went forward along this part of the graph, uh, then back up the graph to this point number two, another Nova withdrawal. Then we went up, back up this part of the graph to another o Nova and OMG market withdrawal. And now we've been traversing this part of the graph here back to this uh, transaction. Okay. And so now we'll inspect the inputs to this uh, small cluster. And expand them just so that we can see this is another um, set of spends pro possibly or probably from Nova, but again, at least associated with you know, dark net markets. This is probably um, another withdrawal payout, though these, uh, this is not clustered with the rest of Nova. If you look at this, we've got another uh, Nova withdrawal and a relatively small cluster here, which we may be able to continue to traverse but we'll add another note here as well. And again, continue traversing this part of the graph. Turn off comments. Uh, another uh, small cluster we can apply the unnecessary input heuristic again um, for this uh, 0.0096 uh, Bitcoin amount. Um, this may be a payment. Yes, it is a payment. Um, and let's take a look at this cluster. It's an anon, which OXT uh, assigns to clusters. Um, and we can give these anons names if we either interact with the cluster or uh, see any uh, information that might tell us who this wallet may be. Um, in this case, we'll look at some of the activity of this cluster. A very high number of inputs relative to outputs. These are daily volumes, um, not much pattern here to see. Addresses, UTXOs, um, but one thing that can be pretty helpful is the uh, temporal pattern of when the uh, outputs associated with this cluster are spent. Um, we see uh, a peak activity range for this cluster between about 9 a.m. UTC and 9 p.m. UTC. And if we come back to our graph, and we look at Nova, we might be able to compare some of that and make some assumptions about this, this entity as well. Um, so if we look at Nova's activity, again, 
many more incoming transactions to, to outgoing transactions. Um, and we'll just quickly look at the temporal pattern again. Um, shows mostly peak activity again about 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Um, UTC, which is very similar to uh, this cluster. Um, this may not be a, a darknet market, but um, it's probably another Russian entity at the very least, or Russian related entity at the very least. So where were we? So this was a payment. This is a different fingerprint. Not sure we want to go that way. And this is a, a withdrawal from this entity. So this was a change output. This was probably, okay, yeah, this was a reused address. So I don't think that um, the wallet that we've been tracking controlled either of uh, these inputs. Um, this was uh, a span from this cluster. Um, and so I think that we'll stop that one there. And so I think that just about stops uh, the graph traversal that we can, we can do for this entity. Um, and the only thing left to sort of revisit is um, this Binance address. And for anyone who doesn't know, um, Binance gives out static deposit addresses. Um, each one is assigned to basically a, a single user. Um, so any payments into and out of that address are now potentially uh, link uh, all the, uh, the related blockchain activity uh, for that address. So we'll take a look at this address briefly and see if we can't figure out who this might be. Um, so this is another deposit to this address. We'll again open the transaction graph and just briefly traverse back. This was our payment. And if we go back to hops, we see another you know, reused addresses inputs. Um, again, this same Anon cluster and uh, ANOVA withdrawal. Um, so let's take one or two more looks at some of the activity with this Binance address. Another deposit, in this case, two inputs and two outputs. A reused address. OMG market. And this transaction was a, uh, a Nova payout. Um, so we're starting to get a bit of an idea about uh, this Binance address. Um, it's definitely related to, you know, Russian darknet market activity. Um, and if we recall, Hydra market, I believe, was shut down on either April 4th or April 5th. If we go back to just before that, um, might we see some Hydra activity? And we do. Um, so while we don't know um, who controls this address, uh, if it's directly controlled by this potential vendor or it's the vendor paying to someone else, um, we do know that uh, this address, you know, frequently receives from, uh, you know, this part of the, uh, the transaction graph. And so I think that just about wraps this up, this part of the graph traversal. Um, we'll toggle on and off the marked UTXOs and you can pretty much see um, how those P2PKH uh, addresses all stand out. Um, we didn't really inspect the future spending of some of these um, outputs. Um, there may be additional clues here especially if some of these addresses are reused, but really this, um, this Binance address is uh, a killer. Um, let's see. So I think that's probably a good place to stop this. I'll bookmark this uh, transaction um, and maybe talk a little bit briefly about some of the other features in the, the tools panel that have been added. Um, 
there's a mark transaction button now um, that we are using to basically export information to CSV or JSON. Um, we've also got um, a, a screenshot uh, button as well. And last but not least, the bookmark button. And so I'll title this street side session. OXT. And drop this in the chat. And that's probably a good place to uh, open it up for questions. I think one thing that would be kind of cool, Ergo, is if you um, turn off fingerprint mode so that okay. our users can see what a big difference fingerprint mode actually makes um, in visually being able to to track uh, the wallet activity. Yeah, uh, so, so uh, go ahead. Yeah, so I've just toggled it on and off. Um, you know, and when OXT was created, I mean, Laurent will tell me the exact date, but I sometime 2014, 15, maybe, you know, I, I might have been the first time I even heard of it or started playing with it, right? But back when, if we go back to that uh, slide that I showed when we started, um, before SegWit was introduced, um, there was almost no need to even have a, a fingerprint mode. Um, the only thing that really mattered were the amounts and, the, you know, the relative line weights. Um, but now that uh, the Bitcoin network has continued to soft fork in new features and introduce new script types, um, this fingerprint mode um, really uh, shows just how um, how applicable that that different script type heuristic can be, right? Um, so, you know, just toggling between uh, fingerprint mode on and off um, really reveals, you know, a lot of information. And so even if you sort of stumble on this without um, knowing what these outputs are. Um, are they public key hash? Are they, uh, um, you know, native SegWit? It doesn't really matter. Um, you can just see kind of natively. Uh, yeah, this, these yellow lines are probably all the same wallet. Um, all the nodes on this graph are all the same as well. Um, so we're probably seeing the same entity making uh, many payments. Thank you, Ergo. I think I can speak for everyone when I say we're very happy you're working for the good guys, <laughs> as opposed to, <laughs> as opposed to chain analysis uh, black box. Uh, and, and if you guys are new here and you don't understand why we're doing this, uh, we call this self defense uh, chain analysis. If you if you're unable to uh, review your own transactions and audit your own transactions to see where your weaknesses lie. Uh, you're working at a disadvantage. There's an information asymmetry there where, where the black box uh, chain analysis firms uh, have this information and you don't. So OXT's entire mission is to give you access to the same tools that your adversary has so you can build up your self-defenses. And that's what Ergo and LeBron uh, do every single day is, is figure out a way uh, figure out ways to make it easier for you to audit and review your activity on the blockchain. So I guess we can open up to questions, right, Ergo? If anyone yeah. has any. Uh, I don't believe anyone is force muted on the chat, so you can uh, speak if you want, or you can drop a question into the Telegram chat. I think you stunned them, Ergo. Yeah, yeah, or they're all asleep. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's, that's a first, no questions. I see five people oh. typing. There we go. Okay. Why does seg SegWit increase accuracy? Yeah, I answered that a little bit later. Um, that different script type heuristic uh, now becomes much more applicable. Um, you know, every new script type uh, only sort of 
serves to potentially enhance uh, that different script type heuristic. Um, you know, back when it was only basically pay to public key hash addresses, uh, that heuristic didn't apply, right? So Constantine has a question. Uh, what are some steps this user could have taken to better uh, secure their privacy? Coin joins at what point? Yeah. Um, the first thing is to use uh, a wallet that will um, do a little bit of, uh, you know, randomization against fingerprinting. Um, so there's two sort of trackings to defend against. One would be sort of the automated tracking, um, which is how we sort of introduce this problem and those sort of academic papers that are coming down the pipeline. Um, that fingerprinting, uh, those fingerprint printing bake, uh, breaking heuristics, um, like like tight scripts, randomized chain positioning, and a few other things can be applied by the wallet, you know, by default. Um, very few wallets do this. Um, Samurai implemented this, uh, some of these uh, defenses a long time ago. Um, so one thing would be to use a wallet that will do those automated, you know, best practices for you. Um, the next thing would be obviously um, to break the link between your past history and your future spending with a coin join like Whirlpool. Um, so even if someone like me gets a little nosy, takes a look at some of the uh, you know darknet market activity pulls up a withdrawal that withdrawal is we'll just say one or two hops from a whirlpool mix and for the most part that ends my analysis um, i can no longer track the forward spending of that user right so that would be another big thing and then probably last but not least is to avoid binance um, or any exchange that uh you know basically forces you to uh associate all of your transaction activity by that that forced address reuse. So, you know, using a wallet that has same defaults, coin joining to establish forward privacy and uh, avoiding that address reuse um, are some of the big steps. Absolutely. Um, Mickey asked, is it possible for this tool or something similar to be made available for people to utilize with their own full node? Uh, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, the, the short answer is, not OXT. I, I believe there are other types of tools um, that you can explore to um, run with your own full node. Uh, the way OXT works is a graphing uh, engine. Uh, you almost certainly don't have the hardware required to, to graph this. Um, and just to put it in perspective, when we moved OXT to new beefier servers, we started that process um, and it took over a year to uh, graph everything out into this graphing engine that you see. So sh the short answer is no, uh, but OXT is, is available for anyone to use uh, and you can access OXT via a Tor hidden service if you're worried about associating an IP address to your um, querying activity. Um, let's see, uh, Dev FDO said that fingerprint mode is awesome, although I observed that squares were earlier used for unspent output and now it can be confusing with lock time. Uh, yeah, I, I understand your concern there and maybe the Ergo wants to chime in, but I'll just say when you're in fingerprint mode, consider it a completely different, wipe the slate clean, uh, the concepts are different there. And there's a lot of different uh, permutations that, that can happen with uh, a type of transaction, fingerprint, lock time. Uh, and, you know, we had to get creative on how we denoted uh, these things. So there's always so much well, to do. Yeah, I mean, first off, um, diamonds, I know it's a, a square rotated 45 degrees, um, represent unspents. Um, and that's probably what, you're, what uh, you know, Dev FD0 is, is thinking of. Um, they'll be empty and let me pull it up on the graph. Um, it's still here, right? These two outputs are, um, diamonds, um, 
you know, technically black or with no shading. Um, and again, with or without, you know, fingerprint mode, these are still kind of the same. Um, so it's just something to, uh, you know, just get used to. And, and uh, by spending a little more time on the graph, uh, you'll start to be able to pick that stuff up. Definitely. Um, there was one I wanted, I forgot. Uh, Wild, Snow, <laughs> Wild Snow says, I'm still trying to figure out what's happening on the screen. <laughs> what we'll do, Wild Snow, and maybe someone can beat me to it. Uh, we do have a four part um, medium uh, medium post series that kind of will introduce you to OXT and what's going on here and, and you can do you can read that at your own pace and I think after reading that you'll you'll have a better idea of what's going on. We also have a um, on our YouTube channel a intro to the Bitcoin privacy series that will really get you up to speed visually on how to use OXT's uh, graphing engine here, uh, trend, uh, visualizer. Uh, so watch those and come back to this recording, which I will we'll put on YouTube. And I think you'll probably be able to follow it a little easier. Uh, QR cat says, uh, asks why the samurai mix pool keep information about all user UTXOs and how secure is this storage? Um, I don't understand what, uh, what that means. The samurai mix, the uh, whirlpool doesn't keep information about all user UTXOs at all. Um, so maybe a QR cat, if you clarify your question a little bit, I can answer it better, but I don't understand that question. Um, um, Patricio asked, you know, can you share analysis for coin joins, um, and which kinds of features are observed to link inputs and outputs? Um, we've sort of done this, um, quite a bit. I don't really want this video to run too long. Um, maybe another time we could do, um, a dedicated, uh, you know, look at some of this. Um, but for now, probably the best thing to do would, would be to go look at, um, Samurai's YouTube page where, um, we go over the, uh, let me find it, the Dow hacker, um, here, are there any desktop wallets that use those heuristics, um, that you're aware of? Um, Samurai is great, but curious, um, if there are any options for, uh, that may support cold storage. Um, I would say, you know, Sparrow would be probably your best bet, but. Um, one of the guys that uses Sparrow will probably chime in and say, no, there's a reason that, um, you know, uh, like type scripts hasn't been implemented yet. I think I had asked that recently and someone had um, uh, responded with uh, with that. So um, I'm honestly not sure. I think even Bitcoin Core um, now has like type scripts. Yeah. Um, and I think also Bitcoin Core, um, but it's really not uh, that fun to use. Um, so let me see any other questions. So uh, one thing I, I'll jump jump back to on Sparrow, uh, I, I also don't know exactly what um, uh, protections that they've included uh, on their basic spends, but I do know that um, you can perform stonewall spends with Sparrow, and the fingerprint rules are the exact same as with Samurai. So you can't tell a Sparrow stonewall from a Samurai stonewall. So that's one area where Sparrow has taken a very proactive approach uh, in the fingerprinting machine. Um, AZ also asked, you know, I'm curious about, you know, the Satoshi era wallets. Um, could we detect uh, those connected wallets which are activated recently? Um, you know, it's uh, interesting to go back uh, and look at the transaction graph um, from very early on. Um, it was much more peer to peer. There were only a handful of, uh, you know, basically centralized services and, um, it's, it's much more of a different place than, than what we see today, where everything is really one or two hops from, you know, probably a KYC exchange. Um, so yeah, I mean, you can go back and you can look at that um, on your own. And let me see. Yeah, you'd want like type, you would want uh, out, change output randomization. Um, 
all the, basically the, everything that's in Samurai and has been in Samurai since about 2016. You're going to want to see that in your uh, newer wallets that are coming out. So it seems most of the other questions aren't uh, related to the uh, presentation and they will be answered by our phenomenal community, I'm sure, in time. Uh, but if anyone else has any uh, questions on the presentation, uh, speak now or forever hold your peace. All right, guys. Well, look, thank you all for attending. Ergo, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, we have to do another one again soon. And um, do you have any final closing remarks? No, that's it. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Thanks, you. Uh, we will, again, like I said earlier, we will be putting this on YouTube in the next day or so. Uh, so see you on the flip side, guys. Take care.